Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to see that you're here today. I was hoping for a lot more people, but maybe they'll show up. It's a, a tough time for people to listen um, to a webinar. But um, this webinar today is going to be the last one until the end of, of uh, July. And then we'll be back on a fairly regular schedule. So you can always uh, join the Connecting to Collections Care Announce List, which only sends out announcements. It's not for talking to each other. And um, if you have been receiving it and you happen to have an AOL address, I'd really appreciate it if you would let me know if you got a um, a um, a message yesterday because it looks like maybe all of the AOL addresses have been deleted. So um, if you do that, and you can send that to me at my email address, which is on this screen. And um, that would be a big help to me. And uh, if you have questions and you want an answer from a person, there's a whole army of young conservators who answer questions on the discussion forum. So feel free to post them. And um, they're really happy to have work to do. And in July, we're not doing the ivory, as we had hoped. The person who was going to do that uh, had an emergency, a flood at their museum, and therefore won't be ready to give a, uh, a webinar in July. So we're having one on the care of books and scrapbooks. And never fear, ivory is coming up. It'll be in December. And um, the so in, in August, we're going to do one on emergency planning for collections with live materials, with live animals. And uh, we're going to do a series on map, cap, and steps in September. And uh, the exhibits class, which will be a, a, a for fee class, will be in October. And uh, I'll have more about that later. Uh, we're doing one on digital imaging and metadata in November, uh, and also one on NAGPRA issues. And uh, uh, Jason Skoog, I will post it, except that it's in the slider, and you can get to the announcement there. Um, and one on Ivory in December. So thank you. And I'm going to turn you over to Claire Dean, who's going to be our speaker. OK, can folks hear me? Yes. Oh, great. We were just having a little problem here with my connection. but um, So anyway, good morning, afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for spending time uh, listening to me prattle on for the next uh, short while here. Um, and also, thank you very much for filling out the poll that has gone up. This is really primarily for my interest, so I sort of know who my audience is. Um, and I suspected that most of you hadn't done crowdfunding, or why would you actually be here listening to me? But um, you never know. Uh, so just a, a little bit of background. Um, I'm a conservator, objects conservator in private practice based here in Portland, Oregon, and um, have been a conservator for coming on, closing in on 35 years, uh, which is a little frightening, but there you go. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about crowdfunding. And there's a bit more about my background uh, in the next couple of slides as to what qualifies me to talk to you about this today. Um, I have actually asked also, while I remember this, that I'll, get, I'll answer questions at the end of, of the presentation. So um, type them in or whatever it is you do with this thing, and we'll sort them out later on. So uh, just a bit about terminology, first of all. Uh, crowdfunding versus crowdsourcing, they are two different things, although I hear these terms used interchangeably quite often. Uh, crowdsourcing is when you go to um, a group of people and ask for ideas and data and, and general other information, sort of intangible stuff. And I think of market research as a form of crowdsourcing, whereas crowdfunding is you go to groups of people and ask for financial support. 
I'm sure all of you probably know the difference, but like I said, I, I do see these things used interchangeably, which is why I've put this up here. So um, we're going to be talking about crowdfunding today. So how do I know about this? What qualifies me to talk about this? Well, I've had three successful crowdfunding campaigns of my own. Um, this one here that you just seen, this one, the Story Poll project, which is the conservation one that I have done. Uh, and then this one, which is my current one, we just finished this one in April, the Puddle Town Panorama. And in fact, I'm about to launch a second phase of fundraising for that project. I've also been involved with um, the fulfillment of seven other major uh, campaigns, if some illustrations you see here. Um, combined, we've raised over $70,000 um, for these particular ones. I'm also an avid supporter of uh, crowdfunding campaigns. I've backed over 200 um, in the last eight years or so. Uh, giving anything from just a couple of bucks to several hundred. So I believe in this source of support for all any manner of projects. So why crowdfunding? It's a great approach because it's a grassroots approach and it's a way for you to connect directly to your most avid supporters. It's egalitarian. Um, you, you really do sort of control everything um, and everyone has equal access to it. It's enabled you to access unconstrained funding, meaning that you can do this as an individual. Many of us, like myself, who work in private practice, it's very difficult for us sometimes to raise money for projects because we're not part of an institution. But crowdfunding allows you to do that and sort of frees you up from um, the constraints that foundations may have. There's also no limits on how you spend your funds. You can spend it on whatever you like as long as you're obviously living up to your uh, backers' expectations uh, and any legal requirements that there might be. Like I mentioned already, you're in control. And that means you're also in control of whether you succeed or you fail. And this is a number that still blows my mind. Uh, the current statistics are that in 2015, over $34 billion was raised through crowdfunding across the various crowdfunding platforms. So here's a couple of examples of uh, crowdfunded collections projects. And you're probably aware of, of, of these two. The um, Reboot Suit, Smithsonian did, I think it was last year. And you can see the number of backers and how much money they raised on that project. And another one out of the Smithsonian, uh, which was not quite as large financially, but um, avidly backed. These are very big projects in terms of their outreach and numbers of uh, people who responded to them, and of course, the amount of money they raised. Um, campaigns th that are being run by larger institutions, such as the Smithsonian, have a number of advantages. Uh, you, they can tap into their in-house marketing departments and their large mailing lists and, and social networks. They usually have staff that can help and perhaps be dedicated to these campaigns, uh, such as their marketing and development departments. They have advantages when it comes to the, the incentives and the rewards that come along with most of these campaigns because they have buying power or they're producing their own um, materials in-house that can work as rewards. And I'll t I'm going to talk more about those a little later on. Um, they obviously have high profiles, the Smithsonian, and needless to say, uh, that automatically gives them a little bit of an advantage when it comes to these campaigns. And uh, they also tend to have high profile objects or projects. I mean, you don't get much higher profile than Neil, Neil Armstrong's spacesuit or the ruby slippers, let's be fair here. So smaller campaigns, here's a couple of smaller ones. Uh, and you'll be seeing a, a little more of, I think, both of these later on. This is one from um, Great Britain, from London. As you can see, much smaller, only 194 backers, but they raised over $8,000. And this one, my good friends down in Los Angeles, the Mural uh, Conservancy, who ran a Kickstarter campaign, 
and raised almost 11,000 uh, through about 200 backers. These smaller campaigns uh, are the ones that I'm thinking of mostly when it comes to this webinar. Uh, and I'm kind of making an assumption here that most of you fit into that category, that you're from institutions that are probably going to be looking at doing these smaller, more localized um, campaigns. But uh, if you are from the Smithsonian, congratulations. Um, and uh, you know, maybe you can also offer us some tips here. Uh, I've just been asked to adjust my mic, so hold on one moment, please. There we go. Is that a little better? I hope so. I'm sure someone will tell me. There we go. All right. So a little talking um, a little bit about the platforms themselves. The best known ones, the ones you've probably heard about, are Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, Indiegogo was the very first of these platforms that was launched, I think, 2007. Kickstarter started, I think, 2008 or 2009. There's also GoFundMe, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and then there are dozens of others. Uh, I've listed a few here, Hatch Fund, uh, Patreon or Patreon, Feed the Muse, Chuffed, and there seem to be more pop popping up all the time. Each one of them has its own kind of approach to things. The two best known, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, are both uh, project-based, meaning that they will help you raise funds for defined projects such as the conservation of the of Neil Armstrong spacesuit, uh, or um, if you're an independent artist, uh, your, your latest book or publication, whatever it may be. GoFundMe is uh, a platform for more personal needs, such as medical expenses, uh, funerals, sending your kid to the prom. Um, these personal projects are not projects that Kickstarter or Indiegogo um, will support on their platforms. Although I have heard that um, they may be looking at doing personal-based um, sort of branches of their uh, platforms, uh, probably in response to um, GoFundMe. So, and it's going to be these project ones that we're going to look at, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So, the differences um, between the primary platforms uh, is that Kickstarter is what we can refer to as an all or nothing, meaning that if you do not raise your funding goal, you do not get any of the funds. So, uh, all or nothing. Indiegogo is a keep what you raise platform, meaning that even if you don't reach your goal, whatever funds you raise, you will um, receive those minus necessary fees. Indiegogo recently did launch a fixed goal option, I'm assuming in response to Kickstarter. And in fact, I had a, a project meeting of my own, one of my own projects last night, and I was told that Kickstarter is now looking, if they haven't already, at launching a Keep What You Raise version. So I think they're actively competing against each other, which is no big surprise. But those are the two main differences in terms of, of actual level of funding. Uh, you, either, you either get it all or you get part of it. Uh, I already alluded to they ha the platforms have different criteria for their use. Um, so you know when you're researching what platform you want to use, you need to keep that in mind. They also, ha also have different fee rates, and these fees are for um, the site itself, for the platform itself, and also usually for processing the funds. Some some platforms I hear will charge more in fees if you don't reach your goal, less if you do. The other differences are what are called dashboard designs. The dashboard is what you, as the person running the campaign, see. It's your way of controlling and managing your campaign. Um, they, the, the dashboards all tell you the same thing. It, it gives you information about who's giving you money, how often, where they're getting it, their referrals from. 
um, how many times your video is viewed. Uh, they just happen to have different ways of showing you that data. Um, and some platforms require pre-approval. They will look at your project um, before they'll let you launch it. Um, uh, some don't. Some just let you go ahead and post it and have at it. So common features, though, to all of the campaigns are obviously a project. You need a project. They will have an explanation of that project, the financial goal that the person or, or organization is trying to achieve, a defined period of time. These are not usually open-ended campaigns. Um, incentives to give. Um, uh, Kickstarter refers to these as rewards and Indiegogo as perks. They're the same thing. And I mentioned uh, the fees, too. They all have fees, although they may different, uh, be slightly different from platform to platform. Similarly for the processing. So what you will need if you're going to do a campaign, well, obviously, we've already just had a list there, the projects, etc. cetera. Um, but there's a few additional things, too. You need to have a plan. I can't stress this enough. Planning is an enormous part of running a successful crowdfunding campaign. You need to plan well ahead and during and afterwards, too. This is a process that has got basically three phases. We're going to go over some of these in a minute or two. Your campaign needs to be exciting and engaging and attention grabbing. You are competing not only with other arts projects, but any number of um, ideas uh, and asks for money. Um, and we are in a very visual world these days. So things you have to grab people's attention immediately or they'll move on to something else. You need to have a budget. And I put here that it includes your goal because a lot of folks do not ask for the entire amount that they need for a project. They'll ask for a portion of it. Um, but you need to have your entire budget on hand in order to come up with your goal, your realistic goal, and also just as a general management tool. One of the things that I found with um, crowdfunding campaigns, uh, especially Kickstarter, which is an all or nothing and is my preferred platform, um, is that they really force you to do your homework when it comes to money. It, it, it forces you to sit down and really run numbers. You need people to help you. Unless you're running an extremely small campaign, I strongly advise you, advise you to find a bunch of folks who will lend you a hand, because this is a lot of work. Plus, you need people with all sorts of skills. You need serious social media skills. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about that. You need enthusiasm and passion for your project. That sounds like an obvious thing, but you've got to be able to sustain this enthusiasm and passion throughout your campaign, which can be a little bit of a try at times. And you need time. You need to be able to dedicate a lot of time to these projects if you're going to do them, to these campaigns, if you're going to be successful. So I'm going to go over some of these in a little bit more detail. Your project. Uh, you need to make this very simple and clean and well-defined. You've got to be able to explain this to people very fast um, and without confusion. You need to be authoritative in your explanation on your campaign page. But I would advise you to avoid technical terms. People are not interested in technical terms. Uh, and they actually tend to turn people off. I've already said you've got to be really enthusiastic. People have got to believe that this is important and that it's important to you. You've got to make it exciting. If it doesn't seem to be an exciting project, find a way to make it so. And this is a really important one. Folks want to know why their money or how their money is going to make a difference, not just to you, but maybe to the greater world. Uh, so you, you've got to think big. And this is also uh, another important one. I've spent quite a bit of time in preparation for this webinar going over campaigns. I sort of went through Kickstarter and Indiegogo looking for 
campaigns related to museum collections and museums of conservation, taking a look at them. And um, it was pretty interesting to see how many of them sounded like run-throughs for um, an academic paper or a presentation at AIC or somewhere like that. Um, you're not talking necessarily to your colleagues. You want everybody to be interested in this. So this is another reason for not using technical terms. Um, you're not campaigning for your colleagues or to your colleagues. It can be hard for us to step back like that, but we need to do it. So your plan, extremely important. You can't do too much of it. I'm going to think this through. Do your homework. And by that, I mean take a look at all the different platforms. As I said, I've mentioned Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and you're going to see more of that, um, But of those two. But there are other ones. There are also some local ones. Have a good look through them and see which ones fit you best and which ones fit the group of folks that you think you're most likely to get your funding from. And that homework also involves, obviously, the budget and, and all of those other needs that go to what you're asking for. I've read in some places that folks say that you should be planning your com campaign 12 months out. I think that might be a little ex excessive, especially for smaller campaigns. If it's a really big one, then yes, I could see you needing to do um, uh, 12 months out. But at a minimum, you want to give yourself a couple of months before you launch a campaign, and more if you can. And you have to remember to plan for time after your campaign ends, because it, the campaign, the live part of the campaign, is really the middle of this. The next bit is the bit that comes afterwards, especially if you've got a lot of rewards and perks that you have to get out to people. Um, the fulfillment end is extremely important. Another one that is easily forgotten by people is that you do not get your funds immediately. It's typically about 15 days before that money that you have raised hits your bank account. Uh, sometimes it's less. Um, I, I would say on average the projects that I've been involved with, we've had our funds within about 10 days. But um, 15 is what they tell you to plan for, and I, and I would recommend that that's what you do. And the other one to remember, especially when you are um, sorting out your budget of fees, remember you're not going to get every penny that you raise. There are fees that are going to be subtracted. You have to allow for that. And that takes us to budget and fundraising goals. So again, part of your planning, run those budget numbers over and over again until you're absolutely sure you've got it right. You need to include some things that might not at first be apparent. The costs of the rewards, if you are offering incentives for folks to give, then um, the cost of those, you've got to cover it somehow and typically write those into the amount of money that you are asking for. The cost of shipping them and other costs, especially uh, the video, which we're going to talk about. And if you have to hire somebody to shoot that for you, you've got to cover that cost somehow. Another way of looking at budgeting, too, is to consider matching funds. Some campaigns I've seen have a matching component. So they've, they've got another sponsor on board who has said, you know, if you raise this much, we'll give you such and such. Uh, that's a great way of. Uh, sort of spreading the load in terms of finding funding for a project. Uh, it's also a great incentive for people to give. Uh, I have done, uh, in fact, this is my 20th year of doing volunteer management for Oregon Public Broadcasting. So yeah, I'm one of those people that's down at the radio station on pledge drives. Um, in my case, it's making sure our volunteers are all sugared up and caffeined, caffeinated. Um, but when we have a matching um, pledge, when we have a match challenge, uh, the number of donations we get goes through the roof. So that incentive to give money because somebody else is, is extremely uh, powerful. Consider fundraising in phases, and that's actually something I'm in the middle of right now. The last campaign that I showed you that I um, have done myself was a phase one. Uh, for a project I'm building right now. And 
we will be launching in about two or three weeks the second phase. So that first phase was seed money, primarily for materials to build. And the second phase that we're launching will be to continue the build and finish it and purchase some additional bits and pieces which we would like to have for this uh, particular project. So we've broken it into two phases. One of the great advantages of doing that is it allows you to show your donors that you have done something with their money. So you've taken that first phase money and you um, have uh, used it. You can then photograph it, film it, whatever, and then use that to bolster your second, um, your second phase and sort of encourage people and get them enthusiastic about helping you out some more. Don't be afraid to share your budget as part of your campaign. Uh, folks like to see where their money is going and they're more likely to give if they know what you're exactly know what you're spending your money on uh, it also shows that you you've done your homework that you know what you're doing uh, and that your numbers are realistic and don't be afraid to explain why projects cost as much as they do um, all of us in the museum world know that this is a problem folks don't understand that caring for collections costs money and often way more money than most folks realize. Um, so it's also an education opportunity. This is very important, especially for folks that are doing this as individuals. Um, the IRS considers uh, crowdfunding as taxable income. Uh, there are various levels that you have to meet before it becomes that, and your tax advisor can help you with that. Uh, your accountant. Also, the various platforms have got uh, paragraphs and sections on their websites about the tax responsibilities. For folks who work for nonprofits, many of the platforms have a sort of division or a section that relates to spe specifically to the needs of nonprofits, including the differences in taxation for nonprofits. So this is another reason for doing your homework. Uh, and checking it out. And I do believe there are actually some platforms specifically for nonprofits. Um, I'm not familiar with those, I have to say, but I've been told there are. So we mentioned teams. I said already, don't try and do it all yourself, unless it's a very small project. Uh, that second project I showed you of mine briefly, the, the, the story poll, the shelter for story poll, I did that one entirely myself. Um, but it was a, a, a pretty easy ask uh, and a small project. But even then, it took up a lot of my time. I, for your own sanity, get a group of people around you to help, help out. You're bound to need the skills that they all have. And the other real advantage of having a team, I sort of delegate, is that um, that common interest in pa and passion for the project is translatable to your donors. They can see that there's a group of people who are trying to do this, that, that it's important to a large number of people and you're all on board. That is very encouraging when it comes to future donors. So yeah, the donors prefer to give to an organization or, a, or an identifiable group. They see that as less risky than giving money to an individual, which is totally understandable. This is a big one, social media. Campaigns do not take care of themselves. I cannot stress that enough. In my um, trolling around at, at campaigns in preparation for this webinar, um, I took a look at the ones that had failed, and there are a few of them. Um, and I can spot why they failed. Uh, and part of it has to do with um, the video, and we're almost on the video section. But another thing has to do that it is clear from the updates and other parts of their campaign page that they basically launched this and walked away from it and expected it to somehow create its own momentum. It doesn't. It's competing with everything else out there. The first crowdfunding campaign that I had anything to do with was in late 2009. Um, 
and it was a Kickstarter campaign and Kickstarter I think was barely a year old at that point and it's amazing to see the difference in the sheer volume of projects that were on Kickstarter back at the end of 2009 and today and you are competing against every one of those so you need to push this through social media and through email so yeah campaigns live and die based on social media and email outreach and this is an interesting statistic I found in my research is that actually emails result in 34 percent higher response than the social media call outs so use those mailing lists especially if you work for an institution that has got a membership um, or a newsletter something like that leverage those as much as you possibly can it makes a huge difference the social media part it really involves getting folks to share your project to tell their friends about it um, and when you run one of these it's pretty interesting the dashboard that I mentioned to you because you can see the activity going to your campaign page when you do a major push or you get your team to do a major social media push you can see that spike come in within the next 24 hours 36 hours it's, it's pretty remarkable this is something that actually works very well especially if you already have a donor base and that is to send out to folks that support you already especially if you're an institution about 48 hours before that you're going to be doing your campaign you let them know it's coming up um, and where it's going to be you know, which site it's on etc um, this is because if you can get those folks to donate to you and your campaign in the first couple of days it gives your entire campaign a huge boost Indiegogo says that 30 percent that it says that campaigns that reach 30 percent of their goal within the first two days are the ones more likely to exceed their goal in other words to raise more money than they're asking for so um, getting that soft launch and getting your donors ready to press the button and send you some bucks and get it moving uh, is is really important because those are also the people that will then go and share your project uh, with their friends and hopefully uh, keep the momentum going all platforms have the ability for you to update your campaign uh, so that you can during the course of the live campaign you can post updates as to what you're doing if you're already building something in our case uh, I'm posting updates about our current project as regularly as I can uh, and it's, it's a way of telling people even more about your project so those updates are very very important I believe Kickstarter suggests that you should at a minimum for something like a three-week live campaign do at least four updates these go up on the site um, so anybody coming to it can see them they also will get sent directly to your backers the folks that have already donated will get that update they have the option to control that if they don't want to hear updates they can set their um, mailing receiving thing from the platform to not forward them but um, it you know keeps keeps the enthusiasm going the video this is something that you're going to come across any um, websites or sources of information about running crowdfunding campaigns is going to are going to stress the importance of the video the video because we're in a in a very visual society these days the video is what the first thing folks go to um, campaigns with a video raise four times more cash on average than those that do not so that, that right there um, explains why this is important videos need to be extremely short two to three minutes you need to do it in such a way that you're going to grab your audience in the first 30 seconds and in fact last night I was talking to the gentleman that's going to do a new video for the campaign the second phase of the campaign that we're about to launch and uh, he was saying 15 seconds uh, if you don't have their interest in those first 15 seconds you might as well forget the video so keep it short and keep it energetic and visually exciting 
quality matters, especially the sound. So do the best you can. Make it cheerful, uh, easy, and interesting. And this one I've learned, and it, I'm serious, test it on a teenager. Um, if the teenager will sit through the first 30 seconds, you've got a chance, uh, because they're, they're so used to moving around on the on video games and the rest of it, that if you can grab their attention, um, then you, you've got something that's likely to work. And also, you, your updates can be videos. And this is, this is something that's very appealing to people, when they actually can see and hear things happening as part of your updates. All right. So, um, Susan, I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, can we take a look? I've got a couple of videos to show you. And these are both videos that um, I think are actually excellent. And they are the videos for those two smaller campaigns that I showed you at the beginning. One is from um, the uh, East London Women's Museum, and the other is from the mural folks. So it doesn't matter which one goes first, Susan. You can do whichever one you like. Oh, I guess I pressed the button. Is that right? There we go. Our current project, Galileo Jupiter Apollo by John Worley, was created during the 1984 Olympic Arts Festival shortly after Galileo mission reached planet Jupiter. In this mural, John imagined the rings of Jupiter being composed by ruins of the mythical Tower of Babel. This project, 25 feet high by 200 feet long, is the largest and most challenging restoration to date, involving heavy expenses, which our nonprofit organization is currently seeking to secure funding. Today, for the first time, we're asking for your support. By making a pledge, you will allow us to achieve this tremendous undertaking and finally bring this masterful artwork back to life.
part of this adventure. Help us to keep the Los Angeles mural legacy preserved. So there are two short videos. Um, one of them was under two minutes. The other was three seconds over three minutes. Um, and I think you'll agree they were pretty much to the point and um, explained everything. And they were eye-catching. And that's what you need to try and achieve. One thing that I know appeals to people, too, is if they actually see footage of folks in person. So instead of the voiceover that we saw at uh, with the LA murals one, um, actually having a two-camera face. That I would suggest to you that if you've got, if you are really good at doing that, if you're a good, have a good sense in front of uh, a camera and are appealing in front of a camera, go for it. Or if you have someone in your team who is, but a lot of us find that quite difficult to do. I do personally. I don't find it very easy at all. Um, I think I'm boring on video. <laughs> So um, I would go for the voiceover personally. Uh, so just you know, you've got to kind of get some input from people as to 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 what you need to do uh, to make it appealing. All right, perks and rewards, and I can see we've got a, a question already about perks and rewards. Um, so this is a very important part. These are all very important parts. Uh, we like to think folks give to us just because they want to, and most people do. Um, but having an incentive does make a difference. People like to have a little something to mark the fact that they supported a project. Um, but you need to remember that the fulfillment of these rewards, actually sending these out, uh, is is the work that happens right after you finish raising the money, and which is probably the time when the last thing you want to be doing is taking things to the post office. So uh, this is another part of the planning thing, and that you've got to set aside a time, to set time aside, and also help with that because it's a, a large part of of uh, your time factor. So the statistics from Kickstarter and Indiegogo suggests that the typical single donation is about $25 to $30. I would back that up. But in the campaigns that I have been involved with, I've also found that there are different levels that people like to give at. And these are, to me, the magic numbers. Five bucks, 10 bucks, 50, 75, and 100, and also above that. And if you're going to offer incentive and incentives and rewards, you've, you've got to plan accordingly and perhaps think about the, that level of giving when you're deciding what to, um, pr to offer. Because obviously, if somebody's going to give you five bucks, you're not going to be giving them um, the silkscreen um, hoodie at, at five bucks. It's going to be a, a, a something bigger. Um, I'm going to talk about specific ideas for, for these rewards in a minute. But this is a magic one that I found, too, is combinations. So um, on my campaigns and on other campaigns I've been involved with, with, we will often produce a level that is a combination of two others. So for example, the first crowdfunding one that I did for myself, I had um, an embroidered patch made. And I also had um, a sort of pendant necklace that was like a dog tag. This was for an art project that involved a mechanical dog. It's a long story. Um, those were separately, uh, they were available separately at different levels. Um, and I cannot remember exactly what they were now, but let's just say that the, the patch was at $20 and the pendant was at 30 So if you were going to get both of those, you would typically expect to have to put up 40, 50 bucks, right? I offered them as a combination at 45. And that actually ended up to be that 45 level, the most popular level of giving for that particular campaign. So it's that sort of 
buy one, get the other one half price idea um, makes a huge difference to people the way they think. Um, let's see. Keeping your perks simple, manageable, and easy to ship. So when you start thinking about what it is that you want to offer as an incentive, it obviously needs to be something that's directly related to the project. Um, very common perks are things like I mentioned the embroidered patches. A common one right now, a very popular one right now, are these little hard enamel pins with the little tie tack back on them that has the logo, your institution's logo, or your project's logo, if it has that. Other ones are the very, at the very low end are things like stickers. People love stickers. So for five bucks, you send them a sticker that costs you about five cents plus the postage. There's your so your return is about four bucks on your on your five buck donation, and it's easy to ship. Um, if you go through campaigns, take a look at what they're offering. That gives you a sense of what um, are popular items. The big thing to remember is you have to ship these out. So you need to have things that are easy to ship, that don't weigh a whole lot, that aren't going to cost a lot to ship, and are not awkward. Uh, you can package them in flat rate boxes, that kind of thing. But you do need to make your perk relevant to your project somehow. I mentioned this, the cost of shipping, including internationally. Now, in the time that I've been involved with crowdfunding, this has changed a lot. The first crowdfunding project I had anything to do with wasn't one of my own, but I was one of the, the, the organizers of it back in uh, late 2009. Kickstarter did not, uh, when, you, when you start your campaign and you lay it out before you launch it, uh, when it comes to the perks, it asks you to describe what you're offering and the donation level, etc. Um, it did not have a little button that added in the shipping or allowed you to add in the shipping. And we guessed at it. And we were pretty close on some of the items, but we were way out on a couple of others and ended up losing some money um, uh, with those particular perks because we did not calculate the shipping properly. And by calculating it, I really mean taking whatever it is, putting it in the packaging, and weighing it, and finding out what the shipping is going to be. Don't guess. And this is especially important for international stuff, stuff that may be going internationally. Because remember, these platforms are worldwide now. The, um, the, the change that has happened since 2009 is that both Indiegogo and Kickstarter, when you design your campaign, and you're doing this particular section, it allows you to add in the shipping. So it will say, for example, let's, let's say a sticker. You're offering a sticker um, at the $5 level. When you design the campaign, you put in that 5 bucks, and it will ask you if you want to add an additional amount for that shipping. So let's say you put in 50 cents. Um, when the donor then backs you at that level. When they get the little pop-up box that says, thank you for your donation, you've chosen this level, it will also add in the shipping. So it will say, like a little receipt, five bucks donation, 50 cents for shipping. Um, that was an enormous improvement uh, for those of us doing crowdfunding campaigns. It really helped immensely. But you still need to do your homework because you still need to figure out exactly what that shipping cost is going to be. The other one that we found got us in 2009 with the international stuff was that we had a couple of things that were sent to the UK that were never collected and we couldn't figure out why. And I finally, one, at one time while I was home in the UK, realized what it was when somebody sent something to me and I got a notice from customs and excise to say there was duty due on it. And it was because the value of the thing being sent to me was above their minimum duty. And so they were holding it and expecting me to come down and pay duty on it. And I think that's what happened to the two things that were ultimately returned to us um, from that 2009 campaign, because we declared their full value. And it was way higher than the duty, of, uh, the duty ceiling. And I think the folks just decided, no, we're not doing that. We, we've given the money. We're happy with that. But we're not paying additional duty. So that's a trickier one to figure out. 
um, but I just throw that out there as an experience. When you're ordering perks, especially if you are getting things made for your campaign, such as embroidered patches and, and stickers and such, some companies require minimum orders. I, I, the campaign that I've just run the first phase of, one of my um, perks was an enameled um, tin mug. And there was a minimum order that I needed to meet um, to do to, to make that a reality. We did not get anywhere near that uh, in terms of our donations or at that level, the level at which we were offering that. But it, I wasn't too worried about it because those particular mugs will be used for future fundraising for this project, both in the second phase and beyond. So I'm confident that we will clear that. But you have again. That's this is part of thinking this through because you know, like all these things, you don't want to be left with a huge amount of um, overstock that you can't shift. Uh, so again, if you're having things ordered, think about long term. Is this something that might be able to help support the project or your institution down the line before you go ordering thousands of embroidered patches? <laughs> Another thing that um, has been proven to work is to actually add rewards during your ca your campaign. This livens it up and gets people interested, uh, and sometimes gets folks to give twice. I've had that happen quite often. Um, so that that's another option, and you can do that. It's one of the things that you can change in your campaign while it's live. By the way, um, you cannot change your ultimate goal for fundraising, uh, as far as I know, on any of these platforms. When you say, I want to raise 5,000, that's it. You can do what are called stretch goals. Kickstarter does that. And I believe Indiegogo does as well, where you can say as part of your updates, OK, if we reach 5,000, um, if we it, that's great. If we reach 6,000, we're going to release a whole bunch of other rewards. Um, and so there's an incentive for people to continue to give beyond that initial goal. So that's one way that you can actually extend the amount of money, the goal. Um, but you can't sort of go in there and type um, a different goal, initial goal. So you have that. I hope I made sense there. Anyway, timing. This is important too, and may not be an obvious thought. Uh, first of all, you do not want to do not rush launching. Make sure that you have got everything in place and that you're confident before you press that launch button. Um, how long should it be for? That is a difficult question to answer, but both Indiegogo and Kickstarter suggest 30 to 39 days uh, is the optimum for campaigns. I actually prefer to do mine shorter. I usually head for 21 days. Um, that suits the kind of fundraising that I've been involved with. But if your campaign is more than 30 to 39 days, it, it loses momentum and folks aren't interested and it just goes stale. Uh, and, and you're also sitting there potentially with no more money coming in, but you can't get access to what you've already raised because the campaign is continuing. So remember that. You don't get any of your money until that period of fundraising time has been completed. For some strange reason, the statistics um, from the platform suggest that Mondays and Tuesdays are the most successful days to launch. Weekends are not good because people are busy doing other things, nor is Friday night because most people are doing something else as well. But uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, for some reason, are good days. Um, avoid beginning and ending your campaign close to public holidays because, again, folks are doing other things. They're distracted. They're not interested in whether you're frantically trying to raise that last 200 bucks to make your Kickstarter go. Likewise, Friday and Saturday nights are poor, Sunday mornings are poor, folks are sleeping in, late Friday afternoons. Just think about when you mo are most likely to be looking yourself at stuff on the web. Um, and the times when you're less likely to, that's when everyone else is probably less likely to as well. So that's not when you want to be, certainly not when you want to be trying to make that last few hundred bucks. Uh, this is one a friend of mine recently pointed out to me that 
um, and I, I never thought about this because I'm self-employed. <laughs> so I don't get paid on a regular basis on the 1st or the 15th or the 10th or the 25th. Uh, but um, bearing those pay dates potentially in mind is an interesting one, especially for um, perhaps finishing a campaign. Um, and I mentioned this to a few other friends recently who do a lot of crowdfunding, and they said the same thing, that they try and bear in mind people's typical pay cycles for um, when people are likely to have a bit of money in their pockets and might be interested in giving. Uh, if you're a non-profit, launching a campaign in that sort of end of calendar year, tax year, is, is uh, not a bad idea. That's why you hear public broadcasting suggesting that it's the end of the calendar year and maybe you've got a little money and you're looking for a tax um, deduction. So if you're a non-profit, that might be a good time of year for you to think about running a campaign. Um, I'm I'm not a non-profit. Uh, uh, I actually avoid the end of the year because I think everybody's spending their money on Christmas presents. But um, just another idea for you to to mull over there. So fees and taxes. Uh, I already explained that these vary from platform to platform. Uh, they tend to range between 5 and 10 percent of the total you raised. So the platforms have different amounts they take from you. Um, for nonprofits, sometimes those fees are lower. Um, I already mentioned this is taxable income, so you do need to consider that when you run your campaign. Um, take advice from your tax accountant. Uh, and look at the platforms for information. They all have information on this. I can't remember if I put in something here about, yep, tax rules differ for nonprofits. Um, the fees, there's also fees taken out for processing the funds. This depends on whether the platform uses Amazon or uses PayPal, but those processing fees are also um, taken out of your uh, total. The last campaign that I ran uh, earlier this month, I think I figured out that we effectively lost a total of about 9% um, of what we raised. So the combination of the platform fees and the money processing fees amounted to about 9%. So my top tips, this is really a bit more of a summary than anything else. Have a solid project, a solid budget, teamwork, do your homework, um, have a positive and dedicated mindset. You've got to want to do this. Uh, because you're going to you're going to be living your campaign for the period of time before, during, and after, and of course you've got to remember you have a responsibility to your backers to deliver both the project and rewards if you're offering them. Both Kickstarter and Indiegogo have fantastic handbooks and guides available on their websites. They're easy to find. In fact, I think I put the links to them in the handout that comes with this webinar. Um, do take a look at those before you do anything um, so that you get a sense of what they're requiring. Also, both of those websites, if you go to the Kickstarter and Indiegogo websites, you will find um, pages there with sort of news and updates and statistics. Uh, Kickstarter does a review at the end of every year of the projects that have run that year and of the kind of money that's been raised. They all have useful information that, that will help you with your um, your project. And as I've said already, if it, it doesn't take care of itself. Um, oh yes, this is another thing that is fairly recent. This never happened back in 2009, 10, 11. But in recent years, because crowdfunding has become such a popular um, way of uh, soliciting funds, um, there are companies that have set themselves up to actually help you run and manage campaigns and do the fulfillment. And I've discovered that they're obviously watching the main platforms for new projects and you will suddenly get a comment on your um, campaign page saying, oh, we saw you, we're really interested in your project, it looks great. And by the way, we run a company that will manage it for you or will do the fulfillment. 
I have had, obviously for a fee, so that's going to take money out of what you've already raised. I personally do not use those. I never have. Um, I have a group of people who help with this and we do it ourselves. It might be something if it was an enormous campaign that you were running where you would find this useful. I think most of these are of use to folks who are raising money to launch new products, um, which is a, a different thing, but they're also on Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo. So um, before you take up any of those offers, have a really good look at them because they're going to take money out of uh, your goal and you have probably not budgeted for that. Let's see. Okay, so now um, I'm going to take Susan's advice here. Um, I have got a number of examples of um, campaigns uh, that I've been involved with where you can see the dashboard so I can show you what you see at the um, back end so to speak but also I see that we've got some questions so um, Susan I'm seeking your advice here which would you prefer that I do why don't you go ahead with with that and then we'll do the questions because okay <clears throat> I'm sure that the looking at those will raise some questions too okay so All right, so we'll run. All right, so I'm going to run. There's a lot of them, so I may skip over a few of these. I threw a bunch of them up here just as um, examples. So we're going to take a really fast look at the project that I did on Kickstarter for the um, uh, the Native American Story Poll. This was to raise money to build a monkey hut. Well, I call it a monkey hut. It's a polytunnel over a pole that is a, um, awaiting. Uh, conservation and restoration. So this is the, the splash page effectively for that project and as you go down through it you could, there's all sorts of information about the person who's going to be doing the restoration is responsible for that poll which is my good friend here Felix uh, and also on the other side on the right side is you can see what actually that was the highest um, reward level that we had that 125 uh, which all were taken which was nice there was only two of them but anyway um, Moving on down, as just more information about uh, the rewards. And this is the back side of this. So this is the dashboard. And um, I apologize, these are just quick screen grabs, so I'm not sure whether you can, what, how much of this you can read. But um, this is the very top of that dashboard, so it's got the um, total amount we raised. And how many, it was funded at 134%, how many backers, and below it there's a graph that's showing you the, pros, the, the progress of that uh, project over time. So this is, this is all sorts of statistics and these are updated in real time. So whilst this is what it looks like right now at the end of the campaign, I could have looked at this two days in and seen where we were. Um, there's more information about where folks are finding out about the project, um, whether it's coming through Facebook or um, somebody's searching for it, uh, whatever, the popularity of the rewards. That top one there, Project of Video Plays, it tells me how many people actually looked at the video. Most importantly, how many of them looked at it to the end? And you can see only about 50% of people actually looked at that video, which was about two minutes long, all the way to the end. Uh, reward popularity, so you get a good sense of, of what folks are uh, liking. This information is really, really useful if you run subsequent crowdfunding campaigns because you get a sense of what people are interested in. Uh, which one is this one? So yes, it's, it's also Kickstarter gives you the option to link into um, Google Analytics tracking so you get more information about the activity on a daily basis. So I've, I've redacted some information here because these spray painted out names are my backers including I think their email addresses so that's why those are there but this is my backer report so it tells me all this information about how much they gave me and when and whether they um, asked for reward and if they did whether I have fulfilled it so this is a great management tool. Um, surveys. This is this is actually to do with what goes out to the backers at the end of the campaign saying they've been successful. Please send us a uh, double check, confirm your shipping information. This is the one I just did earlier this year and the one I'm about to launch a second phase for. 
So this is Indiegogo, the previous one was Kickstarter. So they look very similar. They have the main project information and then down the right side information about the perks. Uh, they just sort of graphically look a little different. Um, this is the updates section for the Indiegogo. So I was able, as we did our three-dimensional drawings and what have you, to post those as updates. Um, and folks can look at all of the updates. They can page back and forth through them. This is what I see when I put in an update. So it just looks like a you know regular kind of window that I type text into and um, can spell check it and the rest of it and then launch it. Um, and this is Indiegogo's backer report. And I did check with Eric um, to have his name there. He didn't have a problem with that. But I mentioned something about adding a reward and it sometimes encouraging people to give twice. And that's exactly what happened with Mr. Shapiro there. He had already pledged 25 and I put something else up and he wanted that too. And so he added another 30. So I managed to get 55 out of my good friend Eric instead of 25. Uh, but it's the same thing here. It's got the... the um, rewards, the amount they gave, and um, other information embedded in there. Again, this is the Indiegogo's progress chart. Same idea. I can look at this at any time during the campaign and see where the spikes in interest are. And you can see those as pink columns are kind of like when we did a push and it um, the, the giving jumped up. Uh, again, where folks are getting their information from. This one was kind of interesting. I don't think Kickstarter does this one. It gives me a pie chart of where the funding is coming from. So the most of it came from the US, but I also was getting contributions from the United Kingdom, Japan, and Canada, and France. Uh, so this is a description of the perks that we had for the Indiegogo uh, project. There is a similar page on Kickstarter. I just haven't put it up here. Um, and there are those combinations I was talking about um, that are very popular with folks. So one is like a hoodie in the mug, with stickers and a patch, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, here's the uh, fulfillment report. A bit different to kickstart it, same information though. And, and it allows me to manage and keep track of what we have fulfilled and what we haven't. Uh, and this is an interesting one for you folks. So here's that breakdown I was talking about. So we raised 4,513, but I only got 4,128. You can see the fees there, the deductive fees for Indiegogo and the processing fees. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So which other ones did I put in there? Ah, that's the last one. That was quicker than I thought. So, let's see, Susan. Um, questions? Um, Erica O'Connor asked, with Kickstarter, if you do not reach your goal, can you personally put in the difference or uh, to get what you had raised or what you were aiming to raise? That's a very, very good question. The short answer is no, you can't. You can't back your own campaign. However, that does not prevent you from giving your best friend 500 bucks in case you're 500 bucks short at the end of the campaign. Um, I don't know a person that's done crowdfunding that hasn't done something like that. Um, but the rules are, uh, and, and I don't think they've changed, that you can't back your own campaign. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can you can work around that if need be. And I'll be honest, I've done it um, for other campaigns where we've had uh, a perk level that I, I we've all been convinced would be popular. And it's been a limited one, so there's been like six of them but nobody's taken them. And I have effectively given somebody whatever the amount is, 100 bucks, say, and said, would you donate and use this 100 bucks? They have. And suddenly, all six of them have gone. Because, okay. um, yeah, yeah, suddenly people are going, oh, we might miss it. OK. okay. Um, there, there are several questions about perks. And I'll read them yeah. one by one. Um, how do you figure out the rewards and perks? Now, you did talk about that, but is there anything else? Yeah, it, it, this is extremely difficult if you've not done it before. And I, there is not an easy answer to this. I would suggest that you um, look at 
other cam if you can find similar campaigns that have run and that have been successful, take a look at what they're offering. Um, it, I, I wish that we could do this without incentives. It, it would make life so much easier and you'd actually raise more money, but human nature just isn't like that. So if you can find something that's unusual but is cheap for you to produce um, and cheap for you to ship, then go for it. Um, I know that doesn't quite, I'm frustrated here too because I'm not really sure how to answer that, um, that question. I've always done it by taking a look at what other people have been offering um, and my projects tend to be very similar to an entire community. If, if you haven't figured this out already by the two campaigns that have my name on them that aren't conservation and then some of the others I showed you, I'm a veteran attendee of Burning Man and I am involved, have been involved, most of my crowdfunding has been involved with raising money for art projects for Burning Man and I know my audience, I know who is going to be backing me and I know what they like. But um, I also, you know, you look at the Kickstarter campaign f both for the ruby slippers and um, the Neil Armstrong suit and they were offering very simple things like embroidered badges and stickers and the like, um, which seems to be a universal appeal, have universal appeal. Um, I'm kind of hopping around here, yeah, because I'm, I'm not, it's a terribly difficult question to answer. Yeah, there's a question of, uh, and I, I have to say that I just recently um, looked at a Kickstarter campaign where you could opt to not have a reward. Yes, Th thank you for mentioning that. All of them have that. Indiegogo does too. So you can say no reward. Um, and in fact, that last one that I did, the Indiegogo one uh, for the Puddle Town Panorama, 50% of the people that gave to me did not ask for a reward. Okay. Um, so yes, there is that, that option too, obviously. And um, there is a question, is there a great website to order these gifts and perks? No, the short answer is no. Um, I have got a couple of suppliers that I use for embroidered patches. When it comes to stickers, I basically spend an hour or so checking out the prices for, you know, Vista Print, local print shops that I have uh, here in Portland to find um, the deal that I want. Um, if you know, if you work for an institution that is doing T-shirts, for example, you've got a you're in a museum that has its own T-shirts. Go and find out uh, if they can do a limited edition of T-shirts, for example, and what that cost would be. But um, there are so many suppliers out there. Uh, again, this is where the homework comes in. Um, that there is not one single supplier that 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 does perks. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add this one because it has to do with rewards. Yeah. Can, um, Lisa Rowan said, when should you order the rewards in case people opt out of having them? Okay, good question. Um, I, let's see, I tend to order after we've finished. Uh, if there is a minimum order and we're part way through a campaign and it's clear that we've got a popular level, I'll order immediately and float the cost because I know that, that I sense that we're going to cover it. Um, most of the sites that I think, yeah, no, I know, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, when you set up your campaign and you're at the page where the perks are, there's usually something at the bottom that asks you for each reward when you expect to fulfill that reward. Um, that, so that tells the backer not to expect it by return of mail the day after your campaign has ended. So you can actually put in there that um, it's going to be a month or two months after. Uh, that gives so that buys you the time to do the ordering. Um, this all is part of finding out about minimum orders and such. 
I typically for stickers and embroidered patches order them before the campaign and that is because I know that these are popular for the audience that I am um, engaging with and that I also will use them beyond the campaign so when we have we just had a yard sale for example um, in May uh, in support of the Puddle Town and I was able to have the patches and the stickers there for that um, to sell to folks so that I you know and, I, and we're going to be using them again in our second phase so it's again it's all part of sitting down and figuring this out there's no easy answer to that one but you certainly can sort of give yourself time after the campaign and not have your donors upset about it because they um, uh, were expecting it immediately. The other thing I've just remembered, which I don't think they do on Kickstarter, but I know I noticed they do on Indiegogo because this last campaign I did was with a, uh, was on Indiegogo. That once the campaign ends, you have the ability to lock the donation so that they can't change it. And it's not because that doesn't mean they can't back out. They they actually they can but they have to when the campaign ends they have to request to withdraw their donation it's like the door comes down when that that the, your campaign ends there's a question that goes along with that from erica o'connor again <clears throat> that says are there challenges associated with getting funds from foreign countries currency exchange would i need to deal with this or do the platforms have this covered the platforms have it covered uh, because it's usually done through PayPal or Amazon, which and that's where part of these fees come in. Um, they, my understanding is that the amount, the cost to you, let's say you know your donation level is at ten bucks, you will get that ten bucks back. Uh, you will get that ten bucks because the conversion is done by the payment platform. Okay. That makes sense. And yeah, and Erica also asks, um, and before I ask her second question, I want to know, I want to remind you, please fill out the evaluations. And the link is right here in the middle now. Um, Erica says, is it possible to have the same Kickstarter with two language versions? For example, I'm looking to raise fund in funding in the US and Russia. OK, so um, I have not had to deal with that, but. I do know that Kickstarter now has platforms um, uh, across interna internationally. So you you will see. Um, hang on, my screen just went blank. There we go. Um, you will see campaigns from countries all over Europe, and they've been adding countries for a while. It was just the U.S., and then I think they added in Great Britain was the first secondary one. So they go out internationally. Now, language-wise, I honestly can't answer that question. But I would suggest that you take a look at um, the websites for Indiegogo and Kickstarter and see what they say. You can also send them questions. They do have a so, um, sort of customer support uh, way. I would also do the old Google thing because there are all sorts of communities to do with crowdfunding out there who may be able to answer that that question. I'm also sure that there are probably um, crowdfunding uh, platforms in those specific specific to those countries. In that case, you probably can't just transfer a Kickstarter campaign directly over. You would actually be running two separate ones. So I'm sorry, that's not probably as good an answer as you would like. Uh, it's an excellent question, though about um, languages. So, um. Um, Anne McCudden asks, is there any indication which social media outlets work best for promoting a campaign? <laughs> All of them. I've, I've, I, seriously, I've discovered. See, I, I, have, I have a Facebook account myself. I do not do Twitter. I do not do Snapchat. I do not do whatever the heck the other ones are. I, I'm at that age where I have hard enough time dealing with email and Facebook. Um, but this is another reason for having a team because um, a lot of the folks that I work with uh, are much younger than myself and are way on top of this, far more on top of this than I am. Um, 
I do know that Facebook is a, a very important one, and I also know that Twitter is a, a really important one. Um, I don't know that one is any better than the others. I would advise you to get out on as many of them as you possibly can. Okay. Um, Brent Powell says, would creating a Kickstarter for creating training videos be a legitimate target goal? Absolutely. That's a project. Yeah. A kick, Kickstarter would consider that a project. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the quick answer to that. And uh, Gabriel Newman asks, it looks like a lot of work for a nonprofit to organize. I know each organization is different, but would you have a minimum goal to aim for if you were, are paying staff to run a fundraising project? <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I'm not sure how to answer that one, Gabriel. Um, First off, yes, it's a lot of work. It doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or a or a for profit or an individual like I am. This is a lot of work. Uh, it's a it's a project in of itself. Um, as for for paying staff, I'm just I'm just sorry, Gabriel. I'm just reading you. I see it now. I'm just reading your question again. Bear with me one minute here. Um, would I have a minimum goal to aim for if I was paying? I can't answer that because I've never paid staff to do a crowdfunding. It's all been done with volunteers. So yeah. I can't honestly answer that one, Gabriel. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's a really hard question. Um, Merle uh, Browner has a question. Processing a collection takes labor. Can you crowdfund for that labor? Um, that would be a project, you... wouldn't it? Um, OK, so the answer to that is you turn it you you would turn that into a project so if i'm understanding the co correct the, the collection correctly this would be something like let's say your museum has just received a huge donation from a private collector and you need the funds to do the cataloging accessioning cataloging and you know housing it putting it into storage that is a project and the answer is yes, you could fundraise for that through Kickstarter or Indiegogo. If you were trying to fundraise for funds just to do for your collection manager's position, for example, no. Kickstarter and Indiegogo I don't think would accept that because it's like an ongoing um, overhead cost rather than a defined project. Uh, and so Kickstarter and Indiegogo are very much for these defined projects. Um, you could, in theory, do a GoFundMe because it would be, that's something that would sort of, is like an open ended. Um, I, I'll give you another example. There is a person in my community here in Portland who is, um, has a, 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 a chronic illness and um, is unemployable basically and there are a number of us who donate to her GoFundMe every month to help pay for her um, prescriptions. Lord knows we shouldn't have to be doing that but we are and yes. um, that's a GoFundMe because it's an ongoing um, funding that is required that, that, that that's open-ended effectively and is not a project it's a personal thing so if you were wanting to fund a position in a museum you would have to do something like a GoFundMe um, but yeah housing a collection if it's a, a specific collection that you can put effectively a fence around if you like a definition around then yes that's a project okay I think that's all the questions so um, I just want to remind people about the webinar coming up on July 28th that's on um, caring for scrapbooks and books. And um, we hope you enjoy the summer between now and then. Please fill out the evaluation link. Thank you so much, Claire. This was great. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for, for taking time to listen to me. Yeah, and thank you, Mike. So um, we'll see you the end of July.